About once per week on my stream, I play co-op and arcade with my viewers. Around a year ago, we played a few rounds of a fun little mod that had an 8 player free for all using the real scale versions of the StarCraft units. The mod was okay, nothing special. Whoever could finish a capital ship first would almost always end up winning the game mode, and there were a huge number of made up units which really detracted from the realism experience. But I thought the base idea was really cool. I just didn't think that conventional player versus player matches were the best avenue to go about it. But I knew that there was a place that it would work much better, the Wings of Liberty campaign. Instead of instantly ending the game, if something dumb, absurd, and overpowered happens in the campaign, it's just awesome. So I called up my mod maker friend Rhyme and got advice from the StarCraft Lore Master Subsorium. And after a few weeks, real scale Wings of Liberty was done. The mod is now publicly available for anybody to play, and I wanted to take a few minutes to show off some of the highlights surrounding my first experience with it, because it was a blast. The run starts off pretty mundane. After the turbo dropship unloads the mini marines, it's time to get moving. With only 35 HP and 4 range, the marine is not a stellar unit, but fortunately the majority of the opponents on Liberation Day are also marines, so the nerf is awash. Overall, the mission isn't anything special, and serves mostly to help me get used to my newfound chibi companions. Though I do get my first taste of what's to come with the Vikings at the end, who aren't really any different sized, but are titanic in comparison to the civilians and marines. The Outlaws brings the first construction mission of the game, and my goodness SCVs are big! I never really thought about it before, but I guess it does make sense. That area in the front is not a viewport, but the entire cabin for the pilot to sit. Early macro in real scale is really easy. Even though marines are bad, they're only 30 minerals apiece, so they swarm out quickly. Feeling confident, I move out, save the rebel base, and head to the Dominion outpost. And then, I meet the first terror of the run. The tanks are jacked and marines are tiny. My 40 infantry evaporate in seconds. Area damage in real scale is absolutely insane. I don't think I'm gonna get to use marines for very long. But I don't have to. In my next wave, I fight real scale with real scale. I pull the SCVs and their enormous bods absorb the tank shells. My forces clear it and I move on to zero hour. Which honestly isn't anything very special. The Zerg are super tiny and while they come in increased numbers, at this point they're all countered by marines. As I start to think about which mission I should head to now- Oh my god! <laughs> I'm very excited to continue this run. Next, I head over to the evacuation and learn that overlords are freaking huge and have 500 HP. How the heck do these things only provide 8 supply? Zerg bases must look like hot air balloon festivals. And when they die, it's just a rain of blood. It's brutal. While playing around with the tiny barracks units, I realized something interesting. In these low-tech engagements, the micro-marines have a huge bonus. Due to their size, you can fit a ton of them in a very small area, and they have absurd damage density, making it almost impossible for low-tier melee units to touch them. The tiny fire bats are pretty decent as well, I think. Their fire goes out a really long way, which makes them look useful. The evacuation is a mission that I often find very boring, and after the third of five escorts, I decide to try attacking the Zerg base. What I forgot is that there's a freaking Ultralisk in there. I don't even micro because I'm too stunned at this chonker. He eats 86 units before falling. This was not my best idea. I managed to rally back my forces, escort the next set of colonists, and then find a hilarious bug. The colonists were too small to get onto the colony ship before it blasted off. This soft locked me out of the game, and I had to remind everybody that these streams are for bug testing, and finding tiny bugs is important even when they're not zerg. After the evacuation, I want to see some Protoss units, so I jump to smash and grab. Unsurprisingly, gateway units are nothing special, but photon cannons are legitimately scary. Most Zerg units in the campaign could just be scaled, and the game balance would end up pretty okay. Protoss starships, on the other hand? Well, almost anything under the size of a carrier had to be replaced with scouts in the early game. Protoss stuff is incredibly big and powerful. The scouts, on the other hand, still only do 14 damage against ground, which sounds about right. <laughs> The Protoss base isn't that bad either. The biggest defender is an Archon who's still within the normal realm of size. And then I reach the Stone Zealots. And for the first time ever, this boss fight is actually hard. They fall, but manage to take down over 40 infantry in 10 seconds. Ouch. Next is Redstone, and the mission was mostly unremarkable, until I got to the Brutalisk bonus objective. After realizing that he has 6 armor, and all of my forces hit this 1500 behemoth for 1 damage, I had to get a bit creative. 
I came up with a unique strategy, abusing the size of the Brutalist to hit it where it couldn't reach my forces. After 1500 shots, it goes down, and I figure I should use this time to explain how the armory works on this mod. To encourage experimentation with new units, all unit armory upgrades eventually unlock over time. You don't have to buy anything. To add to this, bonus objectives on missions where you unlock a unit temporarily give the player that unit's armory upgrades, but only for that mission. It's a cool little way to make sure that the new stuff is able to keep up with the rest of your army. Now that I'm starting to fight more and more big enemies, I figured it was time to get the Goliath on Belshir. The way the anti-air works in this mod is that there are two different types. First are the standard units who can attack air such as the Marine, and then there are dedicated anti-air platforms with a different, longer range attack for massive flyers. This includes the Goliath and Viking. While small arms fire is useful against flyers like the Mutalisk, Marines aren't going to help much in a fight against a 17,000 HP battlecruiser. I know this mission is where the Protoss start sending out the big guns, so I offer a mech strategy, going for Hellions and a high Goliath count. My plan is to quickly secure the map, grab the Terezine, and get out before the heavy weapons start arriving en masse. As soon as I get to the second bonus objective, I find my first threat. Thankfully, that first Colossus was just warping in. It couldn't fight back, but those Protoss units are pretty big, huh? Oh no. <laughs> Void Rays are an absolute menace. With 4,000 shields and 6,000 hit points, they soak damage like a champ, and their laser deals damage in a line like the Solar Lance ability. One Void Ray was able to down 5 Goliaths and critically injure about 20 more. I need to get out of here fast. I pump out Goliaths as quickly as possible and start collecting. As additional Void Rays show up, my forces start getting whittled down quickly, and a strike by a Colossus and Void Ray in tandem shreds the majority of my army. On top of it, the huge looming threats end up distracting my focus from the tiny Templar, who managed to land some incredible storms because of it. This mission brought me something that I've never before felt in the campaigns. A feeling of being so overwhelmingly outclassed that there's no hope at all of ever taking a straight up engagement. The mission plays perfectly to the lore of the Protoss and the lore of Raynor's Raiders. The raiders have no option other than busting in, grabbing as much Terezin as possible, and getting out before the Taldorim notice. Once the Taldorim forces are mobilized in full, even at this outpost, they will win. And that's awesome. It feels so freaking cool. The dig was an experience. It turns out that Protoss everything is horrifying, and can bust improper defenses in seconds. But thankfully, the siege tank is just as powerful. In fact, tanks are better than normal here. Due to armory upgrades unlocking on bonuses, I'm dealing less splash damage to friendlies and increased damage to the enemy at the same time. This makes the ground threat fairly minimal. This is good because I was very much forced into mass Goliath for the air. There are waves of flyers that strike the base, and they're all a bit much. The first wave isn't the end of the world, the drill's fire support against the Void Ray allows me to hold, though I do lose a lot. The second wave, uh... The carrier has 27,000 health, and there's two of them. The carrier's firepower wasn't actually the problem. I managed to take out all the interceptors. The problem was visual. I couldn't kill the carriers with what I had, and I couldn't click on anything because of the carriers. I can't move any of my units around because it clicks the carrier instead, and I can't target the enemies because it targets the carrier. This is why we're here, to beta test things, but it is a bit annoying to lose to easily beatable colossus because I just can't click on any of the enemies. Unfortunately, I was running this through the editor as it wasn't published online yet, which has some major issues with saving and reloading. We're gonna have to figure out how to make the capital ships a little bit more reasonable later. Instead, I move on to the first Protoss missions. Whispers of Doom is really easy. While Zeratul and Stalkers are tiny, and Ultralisks and Broodlords are big, Void Prison is completely insane and invalidates any threats from the game. Due to this being a beta test through the editor, I was playing through this mod in an enforced play order, which tries to make the difficulty curve somewhat reasonable without nerfing the enemies too much. In this order, Cutthroat is next. Collecting 6,000 minerals goes about the same as always. I make a large mech army, recruit Mirror's Marauders, and charge Orlin while pulling the boys to tank again. And I get slaughtered. Badly. The majority of Orlin's base has solid defenses, but he has an elite battlecruiser parked over and providing fire support. I tried fighting it, and there's no way. It's too strong right now. Once again, the raiders are going to have to be less about brute force and more scrappy, and I'm all about it. In my second attempt, I specifically target down Orland's siege tanks as I rapidly move through his base, absorb the orbital bombardment from the battlecruiser, and dive the planetary fortress. I'm cleaned up, but manage to burn the fortress, causing Orland to surrender. 
I can't express how well real scale encapsulates the scrappy nature of the Raiders. I would love to try this sort of mission with the Hercules dropship to strike from another angle or get sneaky with nukes. I love how there are times the game puts its foot down and says you can't just murder your way through these super powerful enemies, you need to have another plan. Next up is Safe Haven, and oh my god. The Purifier Mothership Shadow extends on the entire map, and it's so freaking cool. Even with the massively increased zoom out this mod allows, I can only see a fraction of the behemoth. It's amazing. I now have the Viking, Terran's most powerful anti-capital ship weapon. I can finally fight back. I ended up having to play this mission super zoomed in because the mothership is so large that normal zoom levels make it impossible to see anything. I take my time building as many Vikings as I can for the final fight with the Purifier. After taking the three Nexus down, I move in to engage the Behemoth. And then the game goes crazy, Viking missiles fly straight up into the air while the mothership is completely unable to fight back. The problem stemmed from the mission's design. The map is incredibly small, and if the mothership had its two-scale attack, it would be able to siege the player at the zero-second mark, which is a bit much, so the attack range was reduced before phase two. We forgot to give the normal attack range back once the boss fight started. It should be fixed now, so have fun with the real boss fight when you play it. After that is the Mobius Factor, which doesn't actually have much of interest to talk about, but it's nice to see dropships that are actually big enough to hold the forces that they're supposedly carrying. It's neat. After that is a Sinister Turn, a mission where I'm not entirely sure what to expect. Mar is really tiny. Like, obviously, hybrid aren't 50 stories tall, but it's pretty weird facing this monstrosity that can take 10 or 20 units at a time, but is the size of a normal stalker. I find that Archons are incredible against him. Their anti-biological weapon tears through him and allows me to focus on aggression, which I can't do very much of. The left and southern bases both have void rays, and I can't fight them well with stalkers and archons. It's time to get cute again. I end up diving through the enemy defenses, using zealots and archons to tank while blinking my stalkers past the flyers and hiding them in the back, slowly whittling down the objective. I guess Zeratul will learn this scrappiness from Jim in their time spent together during StarCraft 1. Then comes Breakout, which was maybe the most annoying mission in history. It turns out that ravens are really, really, really big. And Tosh is just a boy in spandex. This is not a good combination. Turns out it's really hard to move about when the world's largest detector is sitting by and warning all of his allies about Tosh's movements. Most of the mission is slow progress through, and then I get to the final base, where I end up face to face with these twin Thor guards looking like sci-fi Dark Souls bosses ready to end my poor Spectre's career. I have to use Jim's forces as fire support while Tosh spams stuns on them, and look at their little feet, they're so antsy to move while being stunned, it's like they're little kids that are impatient before recess. After nuking the enemy's production comes the least climactic fight ever. There's a battlecruiser up there, and my only strategy is to wait for Jim to kill it. Thankfully, Rhyme was smart enough to substitute some of the infantry that Jim normally sends with Goliaths, making this not take years. After Tosh, I do Nova, which isn't that exciting at first, but it gets a lot better once I can dominate a raven and bring it in on the fun. For the second section, I send the Titanic Detector over to the objective, drop point defense drones, and auto turrets to win. Seems fair. And then in section 3, I dominate an Ultralisk, and it's a good time. He walks over to the final objective and smashes it with his giant head. It was awesome. Back on the Protoss side of things is Echoes of the Future. First is a no-build segment where Zeratul is a lo- never mind. After this incredible cutscene where the Colossus are super well hidden in the water, I get to play with my first mega toy of the run. The Colossus deal 80 damage per shot and have 15 base range. Good thing we got extended Thermal Lance to bump that up to 17. They're absurd, and it's amazing. They do have a weakness. They have next to no durability for units of their cost and size, so I opt to focus all of my production on covering them. The mission's frenzied attacks are, well, they send out a lot of Zerg from the Nidus Worms, but these monstrous Colossus are unmatched by low-tier ground Zerg. And once I toss in some Immortals, even Ultralisks have a hard time fighting my forces. I know that playing on Brutal is supposed to be hard, but sometimes getting to roleplay as a lore-accurate Protoss and steamrolling through an entire Zerg Hive cluster is a ton of fun. Starting with Engine of Destruction, we made a pass at fixing the air scaling issue. Whenever a big capital ship showed up, it was basically impossible to click on anything. But our solution caused some other problems. 
We tried using independent scaling for air and ground units. We would keep ground units as is, so this enormous chonker of an Odin can march around like the badass that he should be, but air capital ships would be a little bit more reasonable. Unfortunately, this solution made the smaller aircraft look like toys, which was a definite downside. It was a midstream band-aid, and we come up with a better solution in a little bit. But some things are gonna look silly for now. On the other hand, this battlecruiser attacked the Odin, and the fight was actually pretty fun. This was one of those times where I could mostly kick back and let Tychus mow his way through the enemies. Though, I did want to heal him a bit, so I built a science vessel to repair. Wait a moment. Weren't there entire missions that take place inside of science vessels in StarCraft 1? Uh, yeah. Say hello to my 15 supply behemoth support craft who can repair mechanical units and make enemies smell funny. Not entirely sure if this one was worth the price. With my incredible healing, the mid part of the mission is easy. Once I reach base 3, I head over to the Loki bonus objective who's casually clipping through half of the map. After Snorlax wakes up from his nap, he's grumpy and attacks, and Yamato's the Odin, killing him in one shot. Might have to fix that for public release. One of the things I've been looking most forward to in this run is driving the Odin. And now it's finally my time to- and it's dead. One of the things I've been most looking forward to in this run is making Thors. Thors are actually awesome here. Somehow they feel a bit squishy with 1100 HP, but they do area damage with their attacks, and they're able to walk over smaller units like the Colossus. This makes them fit into other armies incredibly easily. They zone out enemies and siege really well. I decided to pair Thors with some Predators because they're super cute and run really fast. The three broadcast towers are hilariously poorly balanced in terms of difficulty. The first tower sends mostly light units that could be blown away by a single Thor, while the third sends two battle cruisers who manage to chew through 40 of my supply before the mission ends. The next mission is one that I'm sure many of you have been waiting for, In Utter Darkness. I can't tell what's going on, but I do have to kill 6,000 enemies. The map is really small, and I end up with a bunch of sky toss sort of in a giant ball hoping that it kills anything that comes near. And it does. It's somewhat manageable before Selendus, but once her girthy carrier has arrived, the entire screen is just orange. At the 30 minute mark, Artanis arrives, gives a speech, and then promptly explodes without any further context. I have no idea how many corruptors there were at this point, but I have to assume it was a lot. Going back to a playable game is the secret mission Piercing the Shroud. When I say playable, it's all relative. The first section is an easy clear. Infantry are a simple fight in real scale, and Jim is moderately bulky. At the computer terminal, there's an option to release 20 Zealots, 70 Zerglings, or 5 Ultralisks from this pen. There's only one correct answer. After the Ultras get their snack, I reload and pick the much more boring Zealot choice so I can actually play the game. Then comes the Garage. Progress here is painful. There are tanks and landed Vikings who can all easily shred through my forces. I could use the Ares Warbot to tank here, but I need it for later. After the room is finally clear, it's later. I have two Marines, a Marauder, two Medics, and Jim. The enemy has a Thor. My only out here is to activate the Warbot with the anti-armor missiles, charge in with everything, blast with all of Jim's weapon pickups while the Warbot's dead. Jim's dead too. I end up resetting this overtuned mission a good 20 times until I find the solution, where Jim runs away every time the Thor finds a new target, fires off one blast, and then starts retreating again. It wasn't pretty, but I reward myself with eight firebats for my effort. In the next room is the Brutalisk, whose research I want. After realizing he has six armor and all of my forces hit this 1500 HP behemoth for one damage, I have to get creative. I came up with a unique strategy, abusing the size of the Brutalisk to hide where it couldn't reach my forces. After taking them down and reaching the generator comes the escape from the hybrid. I just can't take them seriously in this mod. They might be scary or whatever, but they're so tiny they remind me more of an angry chihuahua than a galaxy-ending threat. I leave Fido and find a transport that's lacking a bit in legroom, but Jim will make do. We're getting to the end game, and for the Maw, I knew we had to fix the capital ship scaling. We opted to revert all of the air units back to their normal size, and then instead of using the middle of the road sizes for capital ships, we aired towards the lower end. This seemed to hit a really nice balance, where the battlecruisers are still bombarding from the heavens while allowing the game to be playable under them. I really like the feeling of this solution, and it's still lore-friendly. In this mission comes what is one of the most unique tactical battles I have ever experienced in StarCraft II. At 3,000 minerals, 2,000 gas, and 20 supply, I can't really afford many battlecruisers past the three I start with. But we're facing the strongest Protoss in the game here. I opt to start pumping Vikings to support. 
The three BCs are enough on their own to clear the first half of the map, taking down ripfield generators and ground protoss with ease. As the sky toss starts to appear, things get a bit funky. At maximum zoom, fights between the carriers and cattle bruisers aren't very easy to parse, but I get to experiment with my plan. Battlecruiser damage isn't great for the cost, so instead I want them to act as shields while my much more fragile Vikings put on the hurt from behind. It works out great. The torpedoes en masse are able to clear out some of the scariest sky toss that there is. Some of the scariest. After heading back to repair, the final objective spawns. And with it, the mothership. This one isn't broken. Well, actually, it's pretty broken. In my first attempt, some voids that the mothership was concealing ambushed my battlecruisers, taking one down. That alone should give context to this mission. The void rays were not cloaked by the mothership, they were just hidden under its enormous wingspan and I couldn't see them. Even though I'm one battlecruiser down, I attempt to push in, but the damage on my battlecruisers is too much. Additionally, the enemy ground forces managed to get under my vikings in this four layer high fight, shredding them. In my next attempt, I scrounge up enough money to make a fourth battlecruiser and begin the attack run. As the capital ships move into position, the vikings tear through the supporting void rays, relieving much of the pressure. I push forward, fire a volley of Yamatos, and engage with everything that I have. But once again, the Protoss manage to find their way under my fighters, but the battlecruisers remain vigilant. After literal minutes of trading blows, the mothership falls, with my final battlecruiser dropping only seconds later. And then a void ray came and killed me. The third time wasn't nearly as epic, I managed to protect my vikings so things go pretty cleanly. I loved that fight. The level of tactics as I tried to figure out where I wanted to position my units in this four dimensional chessboard of protossery was awesome. Great stuff. Shatter the Sky may be the most disappointing mission in a standard StarCraft II playthrough. When I think Leviathan, I'm looking to fight the Heart of the Swarm opening cinematic, not some little guy that spawns some mutalisks. There's no way that real scale Shatter the Sky can be a letdown. After building up an army of Mass Goliath and Thor, I head to the first two coolant towers and spawn the Leviathan. With 200,000 hit points not even fitting on the screen, the Leviathan is a monster. He drops me by 20 supply in his first shot, and then he stops doing anything. It turns out there's a problem with how Titanic-sized units in StarCraft II calculate their range. The Leviathan's range on its anti-ground and anti-air attacks are 36 each, but for some reason, the range is calculated from the edge of the hitbox for the anti-air attack and the middle of the hitbox for the anti-ground attack. Once again, we are beta testing here, but it absolutely was a disappointing way to win. Not that I could have won with my army anyway. It took my maxed out, dedicated anti-air army two and a half minutes of constant fighting to win the fight. It does work now, but I can't deny that I'm a little sad to not have been smashed into subatomic particles by the Chungus of the Swarm. I also summon the Jackson's Revenge Mercenary Battlecruiser and promptly learn that Scourge deal 900 damage. Whoops. All In was crazy. The mission doesn't deviate much from normal. Nidus Worms still erupt, Zerg spew out, and then I die. The sheer number of Banelings and Ultralisks that hit is absurd. I tried using the Hivemind emulator to take control of Ultralisks for my own, but at 150 energy per use, I couldn't keep up with the spawning rate. I tried investing in battlecruisers, but despite their massive size, they weren't able to quickly get to the Nidus Worms and take them down. Planetaries could hold strong against the smaller Zergs, but they were too much of a drain to repair against the Ultras. I ended up back on Old Reliable. Mass siege tanks, a flight of banshees to engage the Nidus Worms, and of course, the greatest tool in the Terran arsenal, a wall of engineering base. Using this as a base, I spam mules and mine as many minerals as possible because there's one final threat in real scale. The smallest, most adorable little murder machine you've ever laid your eyes on. Tiny Kerrigan is very similar to normal Kerrigan, but my units are more expensive than normal, making implosion a death sentence. Instead, I make about a trillion marines, a unit who's been effectively invalid for 90% of this run, and feed them by the fistful to Kerrigan. The mission was an absurd difficulty spike. Losing to the powerful Zerg busts was infuriating at times, but in the end, All In encapsulates everything that makes real scale so cool to play. Being charged by enormous organic death machines that roll up to your doorstep, supported by hundreds of smaller Zerg, is a treat that just isn't replicated anywhere else. It took me a few hours to figure out how to do it, but after all of the trial and error, resets, and countless marines fed to Kerrigan, I managed to lose at 99.4%. Er, uh, I managed to beat all in, and I am rewarded with a cutscene, where the artifacts Nova goes off and these GigaChat Ultralisks don't even care. The mission finished with 11,916 kills, more than the entirety of Wings of Liberty Deathless. 
So what's next? What about real scale Heart of the Swarm, and how do I as a lay viewer get to actually play this mod? Well, I have answers to both. The first answer is that real scale Heart of the Swarm is in testing, and I'm doing a beta playthrough of it on my second channel, Giant Grant Games Archives, right now. A new mission goes up once every day. And second is that a full release of Wings of Liberty Real Scale is coming soon. We recently figured out how to integrate custom campaigns into the standard campaign client, allowing players to pick their own planet order and grab what upgrades they want when they want them. In the next couple weeks, we're going to be releasing a mod manager so that people can quickly and easily play these custom campaigns for themselves without having to go in and replace game files. So if you want to check out Real Scale Heart of the Swarm, head to the Giant Grant Games Archives channel, link below. And for more information on the mod manager, a video will be released on this channel very soon. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you taking your time out of your day to come and check out my video, and I hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will talk to you soon. Peace.